Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. We have a wonderful panel set up. Um, really looking forward to our discussion. I'm glad you could join us this morning. Um, before we get started, I want to thank our co-presenting sponsors, Dixon Hughes Goodman and the Van Winkle Law Firm, for helping us put these programs on. It's been a really a pleasure working with them, and it's my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you Katie Fisher, the senior attorney at uh, Van Winkle Law Firm. She's also the family law practice group leader who's going to say a brief welcome. Katie, let me turn it over to you. Good morning. Um, welcome to everyone. And on behalf of the Van Winkle Law Firm, um, I just wanted to say that we're glad everyone could make it and that we're happy to support the important work that um, Leadership Asheville does, especially now in the midst of this pandemic crazy town. Um, so today's topic is definitely an interesting one. Um, and I can say for me personally, as a parent of two sons, one of whom will be entering high school in just a few weeks, um, I'm struggling to figure out how I'm going to uh, manage this. <laughs> What is he going to be doing? How is he going to be doing it? Is he going to be safe? And how am I going to keep an eye on him and continue to work? So I am fascinated to listen to the panel today. And I, and I know all of you are looking forward to hearing from Drs. Mullendore, Freeman, Baldwin, and Kit Kramer. So with that, again, welcome and um, let's have a great program. Thank you, Katie. I really appreciate it. Again, really appreciate the support that we get uh, from your company, the Van Winkle Law Firm, and Dixon Hughes Goodman. Let me also do a few more thank yous uh, to, our, to our platinum sponsors, folks that are um, have been sponsoring the breakfast um, really were great because they signed up and bought tables. Um, and it's really hard to present a table when you're meeting virtually. So I really want to thank Explore Asheville, Parsec Financial, Western Carolina University, and the University of North Carolina at Asheville for their continued support and help with our funding. I also want to thank our sustaining partners who make a big contribution to our work and promoting leadership development in our community. TD Bank, they've been working with us for years along with WastePro and the Van Winkle Law Firm who also supports us in that way as well. Really appreciate their help. And our community partners, their in-kind donation really allows us to further the work we do. Blue Ridge Public Radio, Crown Plaza Resort in Asheville, Asheville 103.3 FM Radio, Gray Line Trolley Tours, and the YMCA Blue Ridge Assembly. Really appreciate all of their help and support. I'd be remiss if I didn't thank our planning team as well. Jesse Fry, Michelle Keenan, uh, Elise Lewis, and Austin Polson. They've done a great job pulling together for this program for the summer. Uh, as Katie mentioned, this program is really a continuation of the programs we have been doing, where we've looked back at challenges that Asheville has faced in the past, have moved forward with um, where we are right now and what does opening look like and we want to continue that conversation so i am really pleased to introduce our panelists today joining us is dr tony baldwin the superintendent of buncombe county schools kit kramer the president and ceo of the asheville area chamber of commerce dr gene freeman superintendent of asheville city schools and it's great to have back Dr. Jennifer Mullendore, the Interim Health Director and Medical Director at Buncombe County Health and Human Services. I want to talk to all of them. We're going to start first um, with Dr. Mullendore to ask about where we stand with our numbers, what's happening, what trends are we seeing, um, and, and really where we go from here. So with that, Dr. Mullendore, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you share your slides. And as she's getting ready to do that, let me just chime in. Folks, if you have questions throughout the program, please use the Q&A box. We'll actually monitor that one. I know the chat box is on and that was a chance for folks to just connect with people they haven't seen in a while. 
Um, I think it's kind of fun when you see somebody in attendance that you haven't seen and you can shoot them a quick uh, chat that way. We're not going to monitor the chat. It will be recorded because Zoom records all the chats. But if you have a question for the panelists, please put it in the Q&A box. And with that, let me turn it over to you, Dr. Molendor. All right. Thank you, Ed. So everybody can see my slides. We're all good. Excellent. Good, good to know that technology is working for me now. Um, all right, so um, as Ed mentioned, I'm going to give a brief update on the current status of COVID-19 um, looks in terms of like the public health data and trends to show where we are nationally, state and locally, and then what does that mean for us moving forward? So um, this is um, a graph that's looking at where we are as a country, and I don't think this is a surprise to anybody who's, who's paying attention right now. Um, that we are definitely um, in a, what we call an acceleration phase across the country where we're seeing um, a pretty rapid increase in the number of reported cases. So as of last night, it's over 3.8 3 million cases um, have been reported in the United States and over 140,600 deaths. And when we look at how are the various states comparing um, the darker, the deeper the, the orange color on this graph, the worse you're doing, the higher, the higher rate of cases per 100,000 people. And so, as we know, if we're paying again attention to the news, you know, the Florida, Arizona, there's Louisiana on there, and of course, um, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, uh, very, very um, intense um, outbreaks and huge numbers of cases. Uh, then we're sort of surrounded by, you know, to the south and, and west of us, the next level of, um, of uh, cases, uh, case rates. And then we're kind of sitting in, the, in that um, 900 to um, 1,100 cases per um, 100,000 uh, people population. So we're kind of in the middle range as a state. Um, as of noon yesterday, uh, North Carolina had 102 1,861 lab confirmed cases and um, just over 1,660 deaths. And so again, when we drill down into North Carolina, um, you know, increasing cases, this is, this is what we call an epi curve showing uh, the number of cases on a daily rate. The yellow line there is the seven day rolling average, um, which, you know, takes out those, those, um, uh, big peaks and variations. And so um, we're, we're, as Dr. Cohen uh, mentioned the other day, we're at a simmer. We're not boiling over like some of the uh, other states um, in the South and Southeast, but we're simmering there. And uh, our percent of tests that are positive um, for the state has been anywhere from eight to 10% over the past month or so. We're currently at 8%. And, and that's how you know, is the number of cases increasing because we're just doing more testing or is it because there's more spread in the population? And so um, um, ideally you'd want that, per the World Health Organization, you'd want the percent positive to be um, below 5%. That's telling you that you're doing enough testing to, to detect cases and that you're, you're not having, um, you know, uh, you're kind of controlling, you're, you're able to maintain um, with your percent spread in the population. So again, the North Carolina percent positive has been sta stable, which is good. We prefer that over uh, going up, um, but we definitely want to get to a point where we, uh, we see that coming down. Um, emergency department visits, this is another way we track uh, what's going on in the community. Um, and so this, um, this is showing the percent of emergency department visits in North Carolina for COVID-like illness, and this is through the week that ended July 11th. And so um, this is what we call syndromic surveillance. So they, they um, use a, a emergency department um, uh, records to look for, and this is all done electronically. Um, they look for visits that were with signs and symptoms that, that may indicate that the person had COVID. Um, so they're looking for visits for when people had cough, shortness of breath, respiratory distress, and fever, temperature, and chills. Now, if you uh, have paid attention to COVID, you know that the symptoms of COVID have vastly expanded beyond that. But, um, but uh, those are the, still the most common symptoms and the kind of the trait, the textbook symptoms of COVID. And as you can see, um, or 
the there are there are graphs for the orange line is our current year where we're at. There are lines for prior years, and you're maybe thinking, well, we didn't have COVID then. Um, true, but COVID and influenza overlap in terms of the symptomatology, and so um, influenza-like illness, COVID-like illness um, are what is shown on this graph. And so the first two peaks in the orange, um, that's actually in influenza-like illness peaks. Um, and then, of course, uh, flu season ends um, and COVID uh, took over. And so as you can see, unfortunately, the trend is going up, which, you know, more people are going to the emergency department with COVID-like illness. Um, in terms of um, what's it looking like in our region, so this is specifically for Western North Carolina. And so, um, uh, the gray line in this graph is where we are currently this year. And you can see we're pretty much mirroring what's happening in the state, um, more visits um, for COVID-like illness. And I will say the Western North Carolina region, compared to all the other regions across the state, we're currently about 1% to 4% lower than other regions. And that's, that's kind of where we tend to be, even with flu. Um, uh, uh, so that's not surprising, but I would say every, every region is sort of mimicking um, the same pattern. And then the state this week, um, I actually might have started over the weekend, just started putting hospital data on their dashboard. And you can drill down by region. And so the Western North Carolina region is called the Mountain Area Healthcare Preparedness Coalition. And this is composed of the 17 westernmost counties in the state. And so this is the data from that region. And so um, as you can see, and this was taken yesterday, um, um, pulled from the dashboard yesterday, so it's the most up-to-date they have right now. Um, you can see the trend is, um, you know, a, a, a slow in increase in, um, in uh, hospitalization so that, um, you know, we, the level had been maybe around in the 20s uh, across the region, um, and now we're up into the low 40s. Um, in terms of ICU admissions, adult ICU admissions, you can see where that also increased recently. And then when we look at what is our capacity in terms of in, um, ICU beds and inpatient beds and ventilators, um, the darker blue is the number that are being used. The lighter blue is the number that are available. And then um, the brownish color are those um, that either there might be space, but they're not staffed. They wouldn't be staffed or um, just not reported. So in terms of where we are um, in our region and even across the state, while the number of hospitalizations um, have increased, there is still sufficient capacity. Um, we hope we don't need to use that capacity, but um, we are in no way anywhere near um, what's happening in, in Florida and Texas and other places where, in Arizona. Um, and then when we look specifically at Buncombe County, so this again is our epi curve showing the, you know, the number of cases reported um, each day. And you can see we were, we were doing pretty well there early on. I long for those days. Um, uh, and then um, once, really once things started to um, reopen, no surprise, um, we, we've uh, started to see an increase. And then definitely um, this month, uh, we are definitely in that acceleration phase of the pandemic. Um, where um, just the number of cases coming in, um, being reported to us on a daily basis is, is definitely at, the, um, at a very high level. Uh, and so as of yesterday, um, and this is again data from the state dashboard, um, we're at just over 1,220 cases. And when we look at our demographics, um, again, as if you've been listening to the media briefings, um, a lot of our cases, majority of our cases are in the young adult population, the 18 to 49 percent, and that, that is the, um, the population where we're seeing the increase in the number of cases over the past several weeks, which again is being seen on a state level and across the country. Um, and, you know, there are many reasons for that, and, um, you know, the, these are, you know, the majority of our workforce, um, these are people who, you know, so they're frontline essential workers. These are young people who don't necessarily feel at risk to the same level that um, the older population does and may, maybe aren't uh, engaging in the preventive measures to the same degree. Clearly in some states, you know, when they've opened bars and, and places that tend to attract younger people, that's definitely led to an increase in cases. So there's many reasons 
Um, they might live in households, right? They might rent and share uh, space um, in households with other people. So, um, so there's many reasons for that. And I, we're all trying to figure out how to message, how to get the message to that group to, to join, um, join in on our three W's. Um, and again, the other uh, um, thing that has definitely been um, a unfortunate um, uh, topic of this uh, COVID um, pandemic has been the disproportionate impact on populations of color. Um, you know, our um, disproportionate impact within this count, within our county on, on black, um, indigenous and people of color definitely, and on our Hispanic Latinx population. Um, definitely uh, something that we're working on and trying to address. And then um, in terms of the trends and like what, what, we're, um, what we're looking at, um, this is similar to what I presented to the commissioners last night um, or yesterday afternoon. So, you know, in terms of compared to the rest of the state, you know, we're, we're in the dark blue um, because we have over a thousand cases, Henderson County, um, joins us in Burke County out here in the West. Um, you know, so our number of cases is on the rise. Um, the syndromic surveillance, like I talked about in the Western region, uh, is on the rise. The percent positive tests for our county um, had been about 2% uh, in early July, then um, creeped up to 4% about two weeks ago, and last week um, and today is at 5%. So again, that's that's um, showing just increased spread in our community, which again is what we're seeing uh, with our case count. So that's going in the wrong direction. Our hospital capacity, as I mentioned, that's looking good for now and, and we hope it maintains that way. The thought is too, if, if more cases are happening in the younger population, um, you know, that's, I mean, Major most of the time that's the population that won't end up in the hospital, although we know that anyone of any age um, especially those with underlying health conditions can have severe illness um, and, and end up in the hospital. Um, but that's, while, while hospitals are anxious, um, that is um, something that um, gives them a little hope that we'll be all right. But then again, we know if young people have it, they can spread it to other people who, um, um, who could be in the older population. And then when we look at, um, you know, again, our percent positivity compared to the state and to other counties, um, we're kind of right there um, in, in the middle, I would say. Test, testing, um, so if you, if you paid attention to this week, it's been a rapidly changing um, um, uh, topic uh, for me, especially over the last several days. So, you know, we've been standing up as a county with, in partnership with, um, with a local federally qualified health center, um, uh, testing sites, three sites, um, three times a week, getting huge turnout, huge turnout to the point that we've had to turn people away because um, uh, just the, the, there's only so many tests you can, you can really keep in the cooler, or keep in a freezer. Um, and so that, um, that level of uh, turnout uh, became a bit too overwhelming for our clinical partner, the FQHD. And so they've had to, to step back. Um, and so that has meant that yesterday was our last um, testing site while we are currently like immediately after this meeting I will be intensely working on uh, revamping and um, making a plan for um, uh, the newest version of those community testing sites so so why I made that yellow um, was just that we are we know there's other testing clearly there's other testing happening in the community at urgent cares at primary care doctors um, and um, so uh, we were not the only people in the county doing testing, but we want to have that available to people who can't access testing elsewhere. And so we'll be working on that and hope, hopefully rolling that out within the next week or two. Um, and then contact tracing capacity, we've gotten more contact tracers. I think we're up to 19 now. They're, they're, they're doing fine uh, managing contacts. But again, as the case, cases increase, that means more contacts. And that means we just need to keep an eye on our contact tracing capacity. Um, so, so what can we do about all about about all this, right? The trends, most of the trends are going in the wrong direction. What can we do about this? Honestly, this is the answer. Um, when the acceleration phase of a pandemic, community mitigation measures are critical. This 
case, you know, testing and contact tracing will not get us out of this. We, it, it's, there are just severe limitations to that when you're in this acceleration phase. There's just no way for you to keep up with the, the number of cases um, and containing everybody. And so this is, I mean, I know people are clearly tired of hearing this, but this is what it's going to take if we wanna get back to, to really um, having everything open um, safely we need to do the face covering and the physical distancing and the hand washing. And um, I mean, you've heard it said from national public health figures that if we all would do this, um, we'd get through this a whole lot better and a whole lot faster. And so, um, uh, you know, the governor's mandate I think has helped. I think when you go out and about, you see more people wearing it, but is everybody wearing it? No. And, do we have cases um, reported to us where people, you know, they went on family vacation, they went to the family reunion, they went to parties where they didn't wear their face coverings, where they weren't um, physical distance, physically distanced. So um, it's it's um, it's going to take all of us to get through this. And so um, I'm going to stop there. And um, I was unable to see any questions while I had my my slides up, but if you want me to look at some now, I can, or if you want to pass it on, Ned, it's up to you. No, 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 just a few questions that did come in that um, would love. Uh, one, are people over 65 that are in great health and no underlying condition, are they still considered high risk? Yes. Okay, and then there was a couple questions around the testing and test results and how long it mm -hmm. takes. Yeah, so um, yeah, again, if you've paid attention to the national media, you know that, um, the large commercial labs like LabCorp and Quest have seen increased demand. Again, as, as cases increase and outbreaks increase across the country, there is more demand for testing. Supply chains for some of the smaller labs, like say um, the in-house labs that hospital systems use, their supply chains um, have been really limited. They can't get the chemicals they need to run the testing. And so they've had to pivot and use LabCorp and use Quest, these, these larger labs which means more burden on them. And while they're able to process like 120,000 tests a day, that's not enough to meet the nationwide demand. And so turnaround time has become abysmal, seven to 10 days in some cases with our community testing sites, it was that way, which doesn't help you as public health. It doesn't help you because by the time you get that positive result to you, that person has already pretty much finished their isolation. And so you're, you're way behind the ball. So it's, clearly not something we're happy about. Locally, we're actually looking to contract with um, a local lab that can get us turnaround time much better than that. And so that, that again, I hope will come out in our new testing um, uh, centers that we set up. Um, the state is working on it, but really it, the problem is the lack of a coordinated federal res response to be, I mean, it's, it's not, every state is having to fight this on their own um, and it's just not efficient and helpful. So definitely a problem. The state's working on addressing it. We're working on addressing it. Um, and we hope that within the next week or a couple of weeks, we can, we can get back to that 48 hour or less turnaround time. Great, and there's a couple of questions there too around um, tourists. And I think, um, yeah. I don't want to be reactionary and I certainly am not pointing blame or anything, but we have a tendency to point to the tourist and say, it's all these folks coming up from Florida. Um, well, I would say it's also our people going to Florida, going to South Carolina, going to Tennessee and bringing it back. Honestly, um, I don't, I'm not going to blame a tourist for it um, when I know that there are people in our county who are, who are doing that same thing. And, um, you know, again, I think it's um, people, we want to go back to normal. God knows we all want to go back to what life was like pre-COVID. Um, and I think that as we've reopened, people have misinterpreted that and, and say, oh, it's not an issue anymore. It's not here. I can go and do my normal stuff. No, that's not what reopening was all about. Reopening meant that we felt we could handle a surge in cases, that we felt we had the resources to not overwhelm our hospitals and our healthcare systems. That is much different than everything's fine and I can just go about my normal life. Um, and so, I, I'm not going to blame tourists for that. I'm going to, it's all, it's on all of us, right? Like, I mean, I'm just going to be honest, just because you can dine in at a restaurant, is that really what you should do? I mean, you know, I, I, I just, I think we just need to, we need to reframe things um, in a better way than we are doing.
Yeah, I think you're right. A lot of it is that perception that, oh, we're reopened. Okay, so let's go to the beach. Um, uh, so yeah, there's a number of those. There's one other question about how many people in Buncombe County are quarantined as a result of testing and contact tracing. Um, I don't have that number off the top of my head. Um, um, uh, in isolation, so people who have COVID um, in, in isolation, I think the number yesterday was like 230. Um, and then the quarantine would be their close contacts. And I don't, I don't have that in my brain, but it would be a lot. Right. And, and the other ones that, you know, somebody was asking about your slides, all of those are on the dashboard, correct? They're on the dashboard. And I don't mind sharing because it's all public yeah. available data. Right, right. So, I'm, but they could go on to the Buncombe County. Um, well, and here's what I'll say about that. So, so because of the surge in cases and the way our dashboard, county dashboard is created, it's really manual entry from the, from the nurses who are doing investigation. As that, as their number of cases like has dramatically increased, they are, they are not, um, they're struggling to keep up. And so all these slides came from the state dashboard, which is where I would refer you. And we're actually looking at how maybe pivoting our dashboard to that dashboard or how can we, um, because we want to provide timely and accurate data. And that's the state state uh, dashboard is doing that. Um, so that's where I would send people. Great. And do they have numbers on how many people have recovered on the state dashboard? So here's what I'll say about that. The state does submit, a, or, uh, I think weekly, they put a report out about recovered. But So let's talk about recovered. There is no great definition of recovered. Um, and, and so what I like to say is who has been released from isolation, because you can release somebody from isolation because they've been 10 days since their onset of illness and they've been um, the improvement in their symptoms now for 24 hours um, or fever free for 24 hours. But that doesn't mean they've recovered. We've, you know, we've read stories of people who have long term sequelae. We have stories of people who end up back in the hospital after they've been released from isolation. And in cases, people died. So, so recovery to me, I would steer clear of. I would say who's actively under isolation and who's been released from isolation. Right. But there is a report on the state's website. Lastly, um, any news on a vaccine? So there's, you know, I think there's um, uh, some, some research that coming out. I, I was um, on a call with the chief medical officers for the hospitals um, in the region this morning and Bill Hathaway shared some data um, that's been put out about some vaccines. So, I mean, we're still in the very early phases, but um, it's good to know that at least there are some candidates and things look good so far. So um, it'll still be, it'll still take some time though. Great, I really appreciate you taking time to join us this morning and please stick around. We may have some more questions, but I do wanna move on to our other panelists. Um, given these numbers and given the direction that we're heading in where things are going, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Tony Baldwin, Superintendent of Buncombe County Schools, to, um, I know there's a lot of folks that are curious and wondering what's gonna happen, what plan's in place now, how do we pivot and change, and what may happen um, if the numbers continue going that way. Dr. Baldwin? Ed, thanks for having me. Um, and also, uh, I wanna say a thanks to Dr. Mullendore and her staff. Uh, We've been having so much conversation every single day that we're actually, we, we've actually reserved her an office for her staff, uh, either her or our school nurse uh, liaison. Um, but um, I, I thought uh, I, I would open up by just saying from my standpoint uh, and our organization standpoint, the one constant that we have seen in terms of the resp our response to COVID-19 and providing a response since March 16th of 2020, when essentially for the last three months of, of the school year, our buildings were closed, uh, has been change. Um, theme, change, and unpredictability. And that has rang true all the way since, again, since March. Um, and just to give you an idea about from a timeline perspective, uh, with planning, uh, we actually began on May 22nd in, in some full speed planning for the 2020-21 school year. Now that's highly un unusual. I don't know of, of stopping and planning for the year ahead prior to finishing out the current school year, at least in my career, but I think it just, again, it, it, uh, it reflects the, the, the challenges uh, that, that, we, uh, that we're facing. Uh, on, um, on June the 8th, we received a 40 page document. We're, we have called that uh, our Bible. 
uh, here in Buncom County Schools because it is uh, it contains all the requirements from the State Department of Health and Human Services um, to operate our schools. And along with that was a plan A, plan B, plan C. And so again, in May, we took that, uh, taking those documents and references and uh, we have been planning full speed and every single day, uh, we've got a team uh, in, in Buncombe County trying to prepare for what August 17th will look like. But just like I told our principals yesterday uh, in, in, our, uh, in our virtual meeting, um, what I say to you today um, and, and what, we, what we communicate in this session can easily change in 48, if not 24 hours. That's the nature of, of what, we're, what we've been dealing with. Um, we did present to our school board on June 30th, our plans, which included plan B, which for us, um, we found out plan B was the direction from the state on June 14th. In all honesty, we were put a bit behind the eight ball because we anticipated that uh, that, that announcement would be made on uh, July 1st, and it was July 14th that the governor then determined uh, that, um, that plan B would be, again, our marching orders. So for us, that plan B looks like our first two weeks, beginning August 17th will be orientation weeks. Uh, K-12, essentially the K-12 will be split in half and there'll be alternating days uh, over those two weeks so that there is at least a foundation established with, um, with some face-to-face some -face contact with uh, our students, teachers. The, the, the challenge for us, and, and, uh, and, and I'm sure for, for Gene in Asheville City, is when you think about the schedules K-8 and the whole structure of the school day, it's very different than what you have at the high school level, 9-12. At, at, at 912, you have the issue of students changing classes uh, at least four times a day, and the commingling factor that is not in as large a proportion K8. So uh, again, for the plan B for Buckham County Schools at this point in time today, uh, on that third week, we would continue K-8 on a week-to-week -week alternating basis. Uh, group A would, uh, would be in the building uh, the first week and then on remote the second week, and we would continue that schedule K-8. With high schools, because of the commingling factor, um, and I might add that even though we had the state regulations, we, any plan or decision that, that we've had in this school system, we have run through our local public health experts, and we're going to continue doing that. Um, but for, for 9-12, they will be on a remote learning schedule beginning that third week. So uh, that's where we are at this point in time uh, in Buncombe County Schools. Thank you. Dr. Freeman, you want to jump in and um, add anything to that or let us know how Asheville City Schools are going to, to handle this? So we're You're still muted. You're still muted. Uh, Gene, will you go ahead and unmute yourself and, and uh, we'll just let you do it. That way we don't play tag. Uh, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yep, you got okay. it. Um, so we're slightly different than uh, Tony in that we're doing K-6 instead of K-8. Uh, those kids will be every other week. Um, we also have a, uh, you know, they can also do virtual academies. Uh, so for
for those people that don't want to transition back into ACS over the next school year, we're creating a virtual academy and asking them to stay in for a year. But our remote possibilities that may transition into a traditional setting are for those parents who don't want to be part of the virtual. It sounds very confusing the way I'm saying it, sorry. But um, as things change, uh, you know, as Tony said, from day to day, it changes greatly. Um, my daughter is an educator out in Nevada. So we were talking about this on the phone and she said, are you still doing Zoom meetings with people? And I said, yes. And she said, so you're gonna ask teachers to come in and work with students. And she told me that Monday and that has been resonating in my mind. Um, just, I mean, this is a great example. So we're gonna ask teachers to come in and work six feet away from kids when we're sitting here doing a Zoom. Um, so, you know, we'll see where all these plans go. Right now we're in the hybrid and the 100% remote or the virtual academy if you wanna do it. Um, I, I have, you know, you didn't ask me to talk about the future, but I'm really worried that the school year's gone. I, I don't see it. I don't see people feeling comfortable, parents, staff, or children in a large degree until there's a vaccine. Uh, and so I've heard from teachers, or so, we've heard from our teachers and the association, but we haven't heard from the parents who work in private industry, as I said before. Um, so I think we need to hear more sides of this because when you logically sit down and say, if we all did virtual, if it went to that, where are all these children going to be? It's, it's disastrous. Um, so <laughs> that's where we are here. We've got a plan. It may change. Uh, but I'm really concerned about the coming school year. Uh, only about 24% of the students in North Carolina will be, do, will be doing virtual at this point. Um, but for those people doing virtual, I don't think they'll be coming back this school year. Uh, so that's my, uh, doesn't sound too optimistic and I'm sorry, <laughs> but uh, that's sort of where we are with this. I'm really worried about our, uh, our kids that are, have been left behind for years and uh, how do we create some sort of outreach to all those? I mean, we have the staff to do it. We don't have a staffing issue uh, under plan B or plan uh, or C, a, a total virtual. So that's not what I'm worried about. It's just we've got to figure out what we're doing and make sure that the public is aware of it. And, you know, I get asked all the time from my staff, well, what are you guys going to do for our child care? And I'm wondering if the spouses of my staff go to the businesses and say, what are you going to do for my daycare? Uh, it's not only the school system that should be uh, looking at what's happening, but how is industry going to help us with all this daycare? Uh, there's going to be like an extra seven to 9,000 kids needing supervision if people go virtual around here in the fall. Where are those kids going? Anyway. That's sort of where I am. And, and so we've got lots of questions that are coming in uh, on the Q&A. And so folks, keep your questions coming. Uh, I think there was a, first of all, is there a separate teaching staff for, for remote versus in-person learning? No, I mean, it's all, our, all of our staff. Um, it, it will, our, we'll just use our staff in a different way. Uh, for the virtual academy, if people say, I'm going to, take the full year out, the Virtual Academy is a purchased platform uh, that closely aligns to what we're doing, but we don't have the time or the staff to create our own Virtual Academy right now. That's something we need to do in the future. Um, but, uh, and, we're, and we're talking about, even if we did go virtual, if we had to, that, you know, we would do orientation, bringing kids in, there would be office hours, et cetera, because if we go virtual, Staff will need to come in to school, but we're going to take away the variable of, of the spreading issue because they're not going to be around children. Uh, but when staff stays home, like they did in the spring, it just doesn't, we can't monitor and know what's going on. So even if we skip plan B 
an A and went to C, you know, we're going to have to request staff come in. I mean, we're going to let them bring their kids K through 12 in so they don't have any daycare issues or, or with their own children. But uh, we just got to have staff on campus and, and utilize them in ways to outreach to everyone. If we, if we were to go to C, right now we're going plan A and B, but we'll see where we go from here. And so your thinking is if the cases continue to rise, um, as we've seen from the trend data from Dr. Mullendore, there's a likelihood we will go to plan C. Well, we'll go to plan C. Just take, for example, when the restrictions loosened and people went out. You know, I see, I see some people without masks. I see a lot of people with masks, but the numbers have gone up. So my philosophy is when more people congregate, no matter what, the statistical uh, outcomes are you're going to get more cases. Uh, and so, and, and, you know, how do you keep kids from hugging each other? I mean, if you've ever seen kindergartners in line, mm -hmm. to keep kindergartners six feet apart, I think if you could do that, you could write a book and make a million dollars. The human being is made to socialize. And this whole fallacy about keeping little kids six feet apart, some will do it, some will not. It, it's just, it, it, there's a lot of nuances to any plan that you come up with. And uh, so that's sort of where we are with it. And we've got to make a decision pretty soon, uh, you know, what we're going to do. And I am concerned about the numbers. Uh, I'm concerned about if we get one case. Um, and I'm also concerned that if our staff goes home, that our kids will get not get a great education because the spring was just us working and doing as much as we could, but it wasn't great outcomes. You know, we didn't have the ability to monitor and, and really check up on every kid. That's what we're going to have to do this year is to make sure, or we're going to have children that are two years behind that will never make this up, never make it up. So it's all a conundrum that people might die You've got kids that are going to lose out and will never be able to make it up. It's just a, there's a no-win situation here. Yeah. And Dr. Baldwin, there was a question that came in earlier because I think there was a little bit of confusion around the orientation. Um, so two things I think I saw. One was, um, will 9 through 12 be doing a virtual orientation in the first two weeks? Or are they actually going to be in the building? They will actually be in the building, and the way that'll be set up is Monday through Thursday over that two-week period of time. Each day, will, uh, they, will, they will be in their particular period. For example, Monday would be first period, Tuesday would be second, Wednesday third. Again, as we have to figure some way with the high school in order to reduce the, the co-mingling effect. And we just believe strongly that that uh, launch orientation, whatever term you want to use, that it's just important to, to try to establish some strong foundation because I, I will agree with Ed, um, the reality of the last three months, um, I think it was miraculous uh, what uh, the, the remote learning model that we were able to provide at a moment's notice. I mean, we, we distributed laptops on March 16th and 17th, started remote learning on that Thursday. And, but yet, we were forced into that. Our buildings were closed. Our buildings aren't closed at this point in time. We're in plan B, and of course the governor can do that, shift us back into a, to a phase one. But um, it, it's, it's important that we improve the quality of the re remote learning uh, instruction uh, in comparison to what we were we were, had to, to basically distribute at the last second uh, last year. And I think the other point that's so in, in important is, is uh, uh, and, I, and I agree with, with, uh, with what Jean has said uh, concerning, a, you know, there's a concern on, we've got children out there that when we go to this Plan C remote learning model that are going to be lost. Uh, because they're just not uh, capable the, from the support standpoint to, to, to learn and maintain uh, the, uh, the level of, of, uh, of, of achievement that we would expect. So um, well, we may start in plan C or plan B or plan A, but what we all have to realize is 
it won't stay that way. And that's the real challenge for us. We will be transitioning through this school year, maybe through all three plans. And that's the real challenge. Right. And, and I think you just brought up another good point in terms of um, the support systems around kids, um, particularly those that require breakfast and lunch, um, uh, free and reduced lunch programs. If they're all remote or they're alternating weeks, um, how do we address that issue as a community? Well, we're going to have, uh, as we did over the summer, we're going to have uh, points of contact that people can pick up lunches uh, for their children. Uh, we're also gonna go with a, uh, all lunches are free for every kid uh, this school year. We're not, gonna, we're not gonna take any money for lunches. We're gonna make sure everybody gets a lunch and that there's no cost to our students, or at least that's what I'm going to the board with and I'm thinking they're gonna vote yes on it. So we're gonna do the free lunch for every student. And if you're slightly in person, how do you distance and keep people safe while they're eating lunch? Well, we'd have to do it in the classroom. I mean, that's, everything's going to be centered in the classroom. It's going to be really uh, self-contained. Uh, I mean, we may go, I'm sure we're going to go outside because I think if we had outdoor classrooms, that's probably the best thing that we could do. And we are getting tents and preparing for that also. Um, so, uh, but I, I don't think you're going to see kids in the gym running around, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's going to be outdoors or in their classroom, basically. Yeah. Ed, we were, we actually did a jumpstart program that started this past Monday and will run through next Thursday. And uh, we served around 400 um, students, grades two and three uh, in 19, on 19 of our campuses. And, and some of the reason that we went ahead and did that was we wanted to see what plan B would look like. Because again, it's one thing to see what is on paper and strategize. It's another thing, as, as Gene said, when you're putting these children in the room at that age to see, you know, what are their, what are their behaviors? And also from the teaching standpoint, how, how do we maintain that safety and uh, keep the good, keep the face coverings on. What does recess look like? And um, I, I, I visited about ten of those schools over the past three days, and um, it, it, it is, as Gene says, it, it does not look anything like uh, your elementary days or your mom's or your grandmom's. It is going to be very different. Uh, but this, this is the world we're living in. And there's a question about the start of sports. It was postponed until September 1st. Will practice continue at schools? We're practicing under, you know, strict guidelines. Okay. Yeah, and, and I think the decision, uh, I know there's a survey coming out to all of us regarding uh, fall sports. And um, again, with the, if you look across the state, the number of schools that have, have um, have opted to go to a full uh, full plan C, uh, some on a B, some on a split between B and C. So uh, that's going to be interesting to see what does happen with fall sports. That, that's a whole nother um, set of challenges and issues uh, uh, that, that are going to impact all extracurriculars, not just sports. Right, right. Um, and, and I know that um, in the past, funding for schools has come from the average attendance over the first 20 days in school. Um, how are they doing funding? How are they going to do funding for schools, especially if we're in a split plan B or in a total remote plan C kind of format? I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> I bet you do. It's kind of hard to budget, right? Uh, we are concerned about that. I think Gene, Gene would share this as well. Um, because if, if we use a trad traditional method of determining funds from the state and for Buckham County Schools, that represents about 67% of our operating funds per year. So those numbers are going to impact what the funding from the state for 2021-22 is going to look like. And, and we, there's a lot of concern with superintendents across the entire state about that. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, we don't know the answer yet. Yeah. 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 And 
Kit, let me bring you into this conversation as well, because I know, you know, we talk about whether it's plan B and kids are home for a week and at school for a week or alternating or we go to totally remote, there's going to be a lot of impact on um, parents at work and are trying to work and trying to get back to work. Um, there's going to be impact on businesses. Um, and, and really, there's a, you know, questions about are, are local employers involved in the conversation about how to be flexible for parents with children who can't be left at home at home? Well, a lot of them have already had to have those conversations because, for example, a manufacturer, it, it, there's just not an opportunity for individuals to work at, at home when you're in a manufacturing setting. So a lot of them have continued all the way through this process and have become adept at, um, at managing it within their own four walls. So they've also had to work with with their employees as well, and uh, it's a it is a challenge for them as well. I'm I'm very thankful that my kids are now adults, and it's not an issue that, as a working parent, I have to address because I know how stressful it must be on everybody involved. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, there's a question, um, Tony, I want to go back to you just for a second, because there's a question in there that, um, well, is Buncombe County, I, one of you, I can't remember whether Dr. Freeman or Dr. Baldwin mentioned that you were purchasing a natural, a national virtual program? Uh, we, we're going to purchase a, we're going to purchase a, um, a, a K-12 platform for anyone who, um, wants to do virtual the whole year, he would, he would say, this is what we're going to do the whole year. Uh, just to give my staff the ability to do either B or C uh, on the plan. It, it correlates to um, our curriculum pretty well. Uh, what's happening here is we have a, a, a percentage of parents that are going to create these pods they've gotten together with their friends and so six to seven families will have their kids in one spot they'll use a platform that we're going to provide them and then they're going out and hiring retired teacher assistants or teachers to come in and work with that group of kids so we have quite a few that are going to do that so they will be the ones that uh, are saying they want virtual for the rest of the year and um you know, with that, I, I, I go back, you know, this thing, as Tony says, changes constantly, but we, we've got to be realistic. I, I don't think, unless we have a vaccine, if we transition kids back in, it's going to be terrible if we have to then send them back home because the numbers rise. So for me, until we get a vaccine, I, I don't think, I think things are going to be really, really shaky about kids coming in and then do you send them home if there's an outbreak in the school because there's going to be an outbreak in the school and when that happens the fear factor is going to set in for our kids our parents and most of all our staff it is going to happen and um, so I mean I know what's logical but fear and feelings are going to take this over when this happens and when you bring this group together you're going to get somebody who's going to get COVID, and then we have to see what we're going to do. Uh, I am really concerned about the school year and how we transition in. When do we transition in? You know, uh, it's just full of unknowns, and I'm, I'm really worried about pulling kids back out of school once we get them started. So, again, yeah. I'm not very optimistic right now. Right. And Dr. Baldwin, does Welton County have a, a virtual platform? We do, and I apologize. We have a virtual academy. We actually put it in place this year and served about 100 students, primarily students that were previously homeschooled. So we've expanded that to 300 slots. It, it's right now for grades 8 through 12, but it is, it, and I think it's very similar to, to uh, what Jean's described. It is more self-paced. Um, there is also a remote only section. We sent out two surveys and that's about 40% of our parents at this point in time have a selected 
to take the remote only. And that will be taught by our teachers in each of the schools. So there will be a teacher in that home-based school that will be uh, instructing for that remote learning model. That was, uh, again, a component of what the governor, um, I think it was highly recommended. Uh, I don't know if it was actually required, but most all of the systems are providing that. And then there's a re remote component that uh, both, both Gene and I have for those students that are electing to fall into the A, B, and C, depending upon what particular plan's called, there will be a remote on an on, on week, off week. Uh, uh, so right. remote is everywhere, everywhere. And, and Dr. Freeman, you had mentioned that, you know, a case is going to show up. There is going to be an, uh, an outbreak. Someone will test positive in some school somewhere. Uh, you know, it, it, to me, it's like when school season starts, you can see the, the amount of flu just over the years past. Uh, everybody gets sick for the first two weeks as they share germs and get used to each other, and then it starts to normalize off. Certainly when my kids were little, it was the same thing every fall. They'd start coming home with colds, we'd all get sick, the family would get over it, and we'd keep moving on. COVID's a little bit, it's obviously very different. Um, are there plans, or what are the plans in place if your school does have an outbreak? We're going to call Jennifer and ask her what to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and it's true. So here's what I would say we have to remember is different, right? So in normal school years, yes, it is true that we're, you know, there's pertussis and chicken pox and just the, what, the crud. Remember, these kids will be in face coverings. They will be separated. There'll be more frequent hand washing. Like all these things that we know help not just COVID, but help everything. Um, uh, and and we also have to remember about COVID. COVID is different. How it how it impacts children is different than how the flu impacts children, or how children impact the flu. Um, children are less likely to get COVID, less likely to to spread it um, than adults. And so, you know, I have to I have to somewhere see something good in this, or you know, see see be hopeful in some way. I have a rising kindergartner, all right? My kid is going to be a kindergartner in Asheville City Schools this year. What a year, right? Um, and so, you know, and he currently goes to childcare. And, you know, he is my deputy health director right now. I mean, that kid knows it, right? Like, he's great with a face covering and he knows how to wash his hands. And so, like, I think that we can, I want to, I want to see these kids being, like, ambassadors of these efforts. I want them to like, I mean, they're, they're kids, they soak this up. And I think that if we can get them on board, then they can go home and maybe they can get their parent. I don't know. I'm, I have to see a silver lining somewhere. But yes, if there was a case, clearly, you know, we have school nurses, um, public health, like we have protocols. Um, there are processes there. It's all going to be about the context of like, who was this person? Where were they? That kind of stuff. Um, but yeah, there are there are processes and protocols in place. Hey, um, may I ask a question, Ed? Sure, kid. Um, and I, and it's for Jennifer. I, I mean, I know that child care centers have been open all during this process for especially for essential what was deemed as essential businesses. Have we seen any any outbreaks in any of those child care centers? Um, so in Buncombe County, we have had, I think, one, um, recently one child care center, but, and I know that there have been others in the region, but it's not like, you know, it's not the mass outbreak that, like, I think everybody was worried about. And so I think that is proving some of the point that children are less likely to be affected. Now, also, child cares are a different beast than schools, I'll say, right? Like, it's a smaller, smaller number of children and, and smaller cohorts, um, and, um, but I think it shows that like, yeah, are we gonna be able to reduce the risk 100%? No, in no way, right? But um, there, it's that balance of like children need that, young children especially, need that, that, that social emotional development part that they can't get by this Zoom call, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I watched my kid do Zoom call like with the, his childcare when they didn't have, and he was like, after like five minutes, he was like, I want to go play with my toys. Like he needs that, um, you know, that age needs that. And so, so I think that, I mean, there's still a lot we have to learn about this. Um, I think that 
Um, a lot of it we'll learn in the, you know, while we're doing it, but, um, you know, there, for those young kids, especially, I, I see is, is if we can follow that guidance and hopefully again, get everybody on board. Um, I don't know. I look at it as the best we can do right now. Yeah. Um, I, I, I agree, Jennifer, uh, but here's something that we haven't talked about and I, I'm just going to talk about it. My staff doesn't want to come back. I mean, the association, so I can't say all yeah. staff members, but they represent all staff members. They do not want to come back. If you see the districts that have folded, it's because the association teachers have gotten to board members. And um, uh, there's a movement in the state, and there's certainly a movement in my district. They do not want to come on campus, period. Uh, and we need to talk about that because I'm not worried about kids not wanting to come back to school. I think they do. I have a staff that does not want to come back to the school setting. They want to stay home and do virtual. That is a big problem for, I think, for all districts. You know, um, I mean, we've got to talk about that. They are, they are lobbying board members to not have any in-class sessions. Hmm. That is a challenge. Uh, however, there are lots of businesses that are, are effectively bringing people back to work. That being said, um, I was reading this article in the Atlantic that was talking about, um, about the eight steps to reopening schools. And it was by people who were very well qualified, secretaries of education, um, disease control folks. And they were talking about all these, these necessary steps. And the first thing they said was, if you're in a category of, of high risk or you know, you've got a diminished, diminished capacity for it to fight off disease, that you should just go virtual, period. And I can see teachers in that category definitely wanting to do that. I understand that completely. Um, and, and I've got employees who fit that category. And so I've had to work with them in my own business to make sure that we accommodate those types of folks. And then we're working with everybody else who has the capacity to come back to stagger schedules, mask wearing, sanitation, all the different things that Jennifer and the public health folks have shared over time. Um, and I recognize we aren't working with kids who aren't used to wearing masks all the time. Not that any of us are, by the way. Um, I, I recognize that it's different and it's going to be hard. Um, I, I just, and I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, flexibility is going to be, Tony talked about change being, being a key watchword. Flexibility is also, and so is resilience. I mean, the one thing I do know from my years in working with, with a couple of public school systems, especially when we were considering schedule changes and year round school, kids are more resilient than adults are in many cases. And so depending upon how we communicate these issues, I think, I think Jennifer, you hold out great hope. The kids are probably easier to deal with than the adults are, and whether it's staff or parents. I mean, and I know all about, I was a school board member and I heard from many of those parents for many years. Um, it's, but the kids will, the kids will find a way if we present it to them and, and you know, that these are the parameters. And, uh, and I wish y'all great luck with it because we, the, the future of our community and those kids, I mean, I'm really gravely concerned about what happens to the kids that are already behind and how we help them. I mean, I'm, I know in my own case, if I have a technological issue with my computer, I've got staff members I can call on, but I'm an adult. And what about the kids who don't have people they can call on in their own home or people who aren't familiar with how to use the technology? I mean, it is a complicated issue. Yeah, or if they don't even have the technology. Well, the schools have done, I mean, my hat is off to the schools because they have provided all kids with, with a tool of some type. The question is, I mean, and I don't know if y'all have the data, Gene or Tony, whether you have the data of how many kids are actually 
utilizing those tools. I know that I have friends down in Orlando, Florida, that there is a, there's a substantial percentage of children who have, while they've been given the tools, tools haven't been utilized for various reasons, despite setting up hotspots, despite doing outreach. I mean, at, frankly, I've been amazed that y'all have been able to feed children and provide them with technological tools and try and pivot on a dime. And it's a very complicated issue, but do you know what the statistics are about how many kids are actually using those tools? Uh, uh, for me, I don't know the exact number, but it was it, it wasn't a good number. Yeah. It wasn't something that I could live with. Um, and that's because there's no advocacy at home to help those kids do what they do. And, and that's the other thing, you know, uh, if you if you do this during the school day and kids are home, how are they going to do it if they don't have a parent there or some adult to guide them through it? But I want to go back and just say again, everything everybody said was logical. The staff, the representation of my staff is pushing not for them to come back. Also, I've even heard that if we do come back, there's going to be a sick out. So now I'm, I have to worry about if we do come back, am I going to have enough subs when I roll all these kids in here? So, um, and this is from the... Uh, state level from NCAE, um, there's a real push for this. And I, I mean, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus, but it's things that we have to be prepared for. And again, my board has heard from the union, uh, the association, uh, but we haven't heard from business leaders or parents uh, about, you know, what are the issues if all these kids are at home. And kid, I'll tell you from, from the end of last year, when we surveyed out, we had, um, uh, which was better results than what I anticipated, but we had around 7%, we've got around 23,000 students, 7% of our homes, even with the hot spots. And I think we, we distributed close to 490 some hot spots across the county that we, we, were, we did not have connectivity for those homes. So we had to provide, um, uh, you know, paper type materials for them. But, um, you know, Gene's exactly right. Th this is gonna be such a challenge. And, I, and I'll, I think both of our systems are very sensitive to knowing that we've got, we do have staff uh, and teachers that are uh, have immune deficiencies. They are dealing with some significant health issues with children. Some of them are caring for, uh, for parents and so, so we're going to, to make sure to, uh, to support those individuals. But uh, as Jean says, uh, we, we've got to have our teachers, even in a remote setting, we've got to have them in our buildings. As long as buildings are open, we've got to have them in there, uh, in their PLCs, planning, working together, coordinating, because there is no reason that the model that we provide for remote instruction in any system in North Carolina is not much better than what we had to distribute again in crisis management uh, for the last three months of the school year. And I really do believe listening to, to Jennifer and what we're hearing with, uh, with, with COVID-19, Remote learning is going to be a, a factor. Uh, it's going to be an instructional model used for, for quite a while. Uh, but we've got to do a good job of, of increasing the quality of that. And that comes on our teachers we, we, and, and our specialists and all of us supporting that effort. Does that mean that they have to be back in, in the building? I mean, does, does that require that they be in the building or can they do that remotely? For, for me, we've got to have staff in the building. I think Tony said it well. There's so much support with other teachers that are non-core content, and they can't do this work that needs that collaboration from individual homes. Uh, if we take away the variable of children, which is their main concern of catching this, and say, okay, your room is, is just like your home. You know, you're not going to be uh, around other people there should be no issue with people coming to work. We cannot monitor what is happening 
and move quickly on what we should be doing if people are not in the building. And there's no reason people should not be in the building if they can self-isolate in their classroom. Let me ask a question, Jean. I mean, I'm, and I'm just asking. I'm not, I'm not suggesting, but um, this, there are organizations like mine, there are many businesses that did not think that they could distance, work from a distance, but we've discovered we can. And, and I mean, I, I have daily meetings with my staff where we're collaborating and then groups will break off and they're meeting and they're, we all have permanent dents in our chair from having sat through millions of, of Zoom meetings. Um, is there not a way to, to uh, accommodate that, that kind of remote learning? If this is truly an issue, I mean, better that than a sick out, I would think. Um, and, and not that, and, and I don't want anybody to get the impression that I'm advocating for us going totally remote either, because I'm sure I'll have members calling me. And Dean, to your point about not hearing from businesses, um, I think, uh, I, I mean, I will ask our members and we'll get that feedback for you. I personally asked my staff to say, so what do y'all think? And I was surprised at how many of my staff members says, we've got to get these kids back in school. We've got to. And, um, yeah. and they're, they're very concerned about, about the quality of what they're able to get uh, online. Um, and I, and I will ask and see what the, what the prevailing mood is. I know there are, we're probably as divided on this issue as people are divided about over mask wearing and everything else. Um, and the numbers I think will, will out in terms of, I know from the, from businesses perspective, once the decision was made at the state, at the state level, to require mask wearing, that improved the lives of a bunch of business people because they could then, instead of having to exert their personal feelings, they could say, listen, I, I run the chance of getting fined if you don't wear a mask in my facility. And, um, and then there are others who have, who have guidelines. I mean, like there are major corporations who won't allow their employees to attend in-person meetings. Um, so they're, they're organizing, their focus has been around their employees um, and, and how they operate their business. It becomes an issue for them. Childcare has never had the kind of attention that it needs. It is one of the core issues for, uh, it's a core barrier to employment, especially if you are poor. Um, that transportation and housing are core barriers to employment. And so um, I think we're about to see a really interesting time and, a, and an increased focus on childcare that extends far beyond just the, those years before kindergarten. And yet there is extreme difficulty in the childcare industry in getting people to work. Um, and in having, it, it is not a lucrative business, unfortunately, and what you get paid to be a childcare worker is abysmal. So as a result, there's already a shortage. Before pandemic, there was a shortage of childcare slots and it was incredibly expensive. I've been serving on the childcare committee, the county's childcare committee, where we've been investing $3.6 million in trying to expand the quality and the quantity of slots. And, it, and frankly, that's a drop in the bucket. For business, childcare is equally, it's a super expensive thing to consider in terms of, I mean, there are even some of our largest employers, including AB Tech, could not make a childcare center pay for itself. And our reimbursement rates at the state level are abysmal also for Buncombe County in particular. And part of that is because a lot of faith institutions are running childcare and are not fully loading their costs. So our reimbursement rate, our reported reimbursement rate gets lower, which makes the situation even worse. Um, that being said, I've talked with the Buncombe Partnership for Children to ask them to work with providers to begin to think about, is there a business model for helping not only with the regular childcare ages of pre-kindergarten, pre 
but is there, a, is there a way that they can think about providing after school care or alternate day care, or could they share slots so that if kids are on one week and off one week, could they accommodate? So they're thinking through that. We've also reached out to United Way, which is doing a number of, um, of community school activities that focus in on after school activities in communities that have higher levels of poverty to see if there are ways that they can accommodate the new schedules. So, the, so change isn't, uh, isn't just one for one particular area, it's for, it's for all of us, yeah, unfortunately. We are just, we're gonna have to find ways to roll with it. And I'm, and I feel sorry for everybody, including myself and every, everybody else who's trying to figure all of this out because it is incredibly difficult. However, I have been impressed with the level of collaboration I've seen in this community. And, I've, and I am convinced that folks in Asheville and Buncombe County have a high degree of creativity. And if we can, if we can find ways to work together, that we'll be more successful in, in accommodating all this change. Yeah, I, I just might add, we, I think we have a very strong partnership and collaboration with the YMCA that pr provides uh, a considerable amount, number of our after school programs. And so we've had, we've had several discussions with them. But one thing I might add, and I'm sure you serving on your panel, you're well aware of this, that if you wanted to start a child care center today, uh, you're going to be facing from the state and probably federal regulations some of the most highly regulated uh, area of, uh, of, of, um, of a business that, that you, you could imagine. So there's going to have to be some, some relief uh, if we truly are going to address this. This is going to be a statewide problem. Again, just because we start out in Plan B, or whether we start out in plan A, at some point in time, we're gonna find ourselves in this remote situation, just like last year, that creates, uh, it, it creates a nightmare for, for parents. And, and I think Gene and I are gonna do our best to, to, uh, to support our teachers knowing that they have childcare issues. But, but beyond that, I think it's really gonna take a strong community effort uh, but nonprofits, businesses, the church community, the network there, um, but but those regs are are hard to overcome. Um, and, and again, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Well, not only that, that you know, if you want to get, depending upon the certification levels of people too, to get a BK, a birth to kindergarten certification for childcare is as expensive as any other type of certification and it takes a, an incredible amount of time and i you know i've often wondered if we don't have people who have the capacity who who have the the fortunate circumstance to be able to work from home who already have a college degree why we can't help them get equipped very quickly to do this type of work and think of it as doing our, our patriotic duty by taking care of our own children. It's a, it is a, um, I could get ranty about it. I probably already have. Okay, so I'll step in real quick. <laughs> <laughs> just to make sure you don't go down that path. Uh, just a quick question that came in. Is there any discussion about testing students, teachers, staff prior to opening plan B get a snapshot of the school, make sure nobody's coming in with it? Or is that because the test takes so long and they're not so accurate that it's not really worth it? So yeah, there's no recommendation for testing, um, mainly because it's a snapshot in time. And just because somebody has a negative test right now doesn't mean they won't, you know, wouldn't test positive or develop symptoms tomorrow. So there is no, at this point, recommendation on any level from public health to do um, testing. What about taking temperatures? So there is, there are they, every, there's symptom screen, so checking temps and, and checking for symptoms and also checking for has any, you know, has anyone in your household kind of thing. So yeah, there's, there's protocols and that's all and that's, you can go on, it's on the state's website, the, the toolkit for schools, all of that's on there.
Yeah, thank you for that question because before any student enters our buildings this school year, they must have a temperature check. Uh, we'll even have a monitor on the bus. When they step on that bus, they'll have that temperature. There's a protocol in place if it's higher than 100.4. Uh, car rider line, same thing. High schools, students driving, coming into that entrance. Uh, anybody stepping in that building must have had a temperature check. And there's a lot of precautions and safety measures like that, that again, you, you're gonna find in that 40 pages of requirements. So you can imagine we have just been, um, just um, immersed ourselves out in the schools, preparing the, the buildings for, for the onset of students at some point in time. All right, are you telling me that if you have a 100.3 temperature, you can still go to school? Jennifer Mullendore, you feel yeah, free to answer. Mullendore. <laughs> I was like waiting, I'm like, who's gonna call me? So I mean, there, there is, um, you know, there's a requirement. And I think that probably uh, that would be, um, you know, you have to have a cutoff somewhere, right? You can't just, there has to be a cutoff somewhere. 98.6 is a pretty good cutoff. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do think that that would probably raise some flags and somebody would probably follow up on that kid a bit, um, a bit more frequently. God so. said, keep them home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and lastly, given the, the amount of change and uncertainty in, in the whole process and where we are, um, I know parents are wondering, well, when will I know my student's schedule? If they're on the alternating first week, second week, uh, right now, Gina, Tony, what, what's the plan for getting information back to the parents on when they might know that? I think for us, it's uh, like the first week in August, we'll have uh, be able to provide that to parents. We have a, a board meeting August 3rd. We've got to firm up whatever plan, I mean, that we're going to go with, and then we'll be able to determine the classes and all that. So probably the first week in August. I would agree with that from our end too, Ed. Uh, there's just so many details. And again, the, the decision on plan B came to us on July 14th. And so we are now on telephones. Uh, every one of our 44 schools, there's people calling parents to verify, is this the direction that you intend to go? And then we've got a staff based upon those numbers. Uh, currently, we're showing 40% want remote, so that that then is the t the principal's going to take and 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 staff and uh, and then we got bus. We haven't even talked about bus transportation because there's restrictions there, one per seat. So we have to make sure that we can handle the transportation of those that won't want to ride the bus. But we got to make sure that that we we're getting accurate uh, uh, data from from our parents. So. Um, it, it's it's uh, every hand on deck, full speed ahead. Good, good. And is there anything you want the community to know at this point? And, and really, how can the community help the school system? For me, I think you should be prepared for kids returning and you should be prepared for kids not returning. I mean, they, they need to have a plan A and B also for their families. Uh, you know, because again, as Tony just said, things change every day. And so if I were a parent, I would have both ready. And, uh, you know, I've gotten, I, I haven't gotten many emails about this. I've gotten maybe 11 or less, but a third of those have been, I want to return to school. Another third is I don't want to return to school. I, I mean, it's just all over the place. So, you know, I, I guess my other thing to ask parents is just to give us some space we're doing the best we can to figure all this out. Yeah, it's not an easy task, that's for sure. And I know, you know, being part of the university, we're going through the same process and that um, they've changed the school calendar. They're getting, you know, we're starting in uh, early August and ending before Thanksgiving right now. Most of the classes are gonna be probably a hybrid of, you know, meeting once a day, partly because um, they don't have the room on campus that, you know, when they start taking the seats out to maintain social distancing, there's only so many classrooms that will hold that number of people. So they're kind of alternating um, when classes can meet in person 
with other classes. So they shared that classroom. A lot more time between classes for disinfection and that kind of stuff. Um, they're putting up sneeze guards and plexiglass and all kind of stuff in some rooms. So there, I mean, there's been a lot of work on the university's campus to bring people in and moving in their dorms, they're spacing people out. So a lot of stuff going on, especially in the dining hall and that kind of thing. So um, a lot of that plan is on, on the website for the university if people are interested in that. I want to thank all of you for joining us this morning. It's been a wonderful conversation discussion and I know um, it may be frustrating uh, for the folks who are listening in who were hoping for concrete answers. And I think um, Kit, you said it best and, and Gene as well, we are in a time of great change. Um, and, and that's not going to stop anytime soon. Um, and I think being patient and flexible and doing the best we can collectively, Kit, you talk to that. This is a time where we really need how to learn to collaboratively work together um, because no one person, entity, we can't, uh, you know, is going to be able to solve this or do it on their own. Um, and I think, you know, the more we can learn to collaborate and, and work as collaborative leaders in the community, the better we are going to be. And I think Asheville can do that. We have that kind of community. So again, thank you for your time and being here. I'm sorry if we didn't get to all of the questions that were typed in. I appreciate all the response and the engagement from the audience. Um, thanks again to the Van Winkle Law Firm and Dixon Hughes Goodman for co-sponsoring this event and for all of our sponsors. July 26th is our next Buzz Breakfast. We're having Dr. Chris Cooper from Western Carolina University will be with us that day. We're gonna talk about the election in the fall and what does a pandemic do to a democratic process? Um, so please join us on that call. Registration links are on the website. That's leadershipashville at unca.ebert.unca.edu. Thank you again for your time this morning. We appreciate you being here. We'll put the recording of this up within the next 24, 48 hours. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day. Thanks.